Oh, so you can see oh, the screen good. here. Then we get the feedback, feedback loop here. If we get, we get video feedback. Yeah, Very that's pretty cute. Good. Wait, I'm not Very recording cute. it. Uh. Oh, there you go. There's the logo. The feedback loop. Infinity, here we come. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, tail of the comet. Oh, I wish I had a third camera getting the two of you. <laughs> So there's our logo. Right. That's right. Yeah. And this is our, yeah. On one disc, you can put 26 hours of standard definition video at 25 megabits per second. For the 30 gig? The 300, 300 gig, gig, yeah. 300 and it would gig. take you four hours and 10 minutes to write that 26 hours. Yeah. So that's quite a bit faster than real time. Yeah, yeah, so, that's fantastic. Yeah. Really? Uh, but you're considering, uh, you know, the, the other, the existing medium don't even come close to that. Right. Even the latest stuff that's, yeah. that's here at the yeah. show. Yeah. yeah. How is it different uh, than, say, the light, the uh, light sensitive plastic that's used in DVDs? Completely different. Is, it th is, it, is there a third dimension involved? Yes, in it? the third dimension is you're recording uh -huh. material throughout the entire volume of so a it's disc. Like, instead of yes. flat, it's like yes. Yeah. So the way, so if this is the the, the disc, yeah. the light is going to come in this way, uh -huh. and this let's this this disc here is has one and a half millimeters of recording material. Okay, sandwiched between two substrates, and in that one and a half millimeters, that's where the active material is that's light sensitive. So the, the blue laser is hitting it this way and then what we do is we change the angle of the laser, of the laser as it's hitting it. And we essentially are recording 350 pages of data in one location, each at a unique angular address. We don't record one bit at a time, we record one and a half million bits at a time. Okay, so think of that as a frame, okay, or a page. There is a device called a spatial light modulator and that is actually taken from the imaging industry. It's used in projectors and, and TVs and it's an array of pixels and every pixel becomes a bit and it's either on or off. So we record that bit pattern with that blue laser into the media that is sensitive to that laser. Okay, so in essence we're taking pictures of data. Okay, and then we change the angle that the laser hits the media by like a tenth of a degree and then we record another page of one and a half million bits. So we'll put about three 350 pages in one location of the media and the disc is not spinning when we're recording it is sitting still the holographic as aspect of it is the fact that we're using the entire dynamic range of that material so all one and a half millimeters have every bit from that 350 pages in that volume you know, this is completely random. You can go to any file that's in any location on the disk. That's interesting. We're also working on rewritable, rewritable material, which will have, the way that will work is you record in one wavelength and then erase in a different wavelength, and there will be a limit to the number of record erase cycles that you do. How can regular media even compete with something like that? I mean, <laughs> So when is this going to be out? The first so, um, you know, we're going to start putting eval units out um, in Q3, and then we'll have general availability at the end of, you know, Q4 of this year, and then volume production will be in 2008 time frame, so it's looking good. That's great. Yeah. We're getting a lot of responses, too? Oh, tremendous. I imagine so. <laughs> People are handing over credit cards. It's like, yeah, we're not really ready. <laughs> not ready for that. <laughs> There's a huge amount of interest in uh, from the studios, from the broadcasters. The fundamental problem that they have is, you know, you've got resolutions increasing, which are generating vast amounts of data. You know, you have 24 by 7 TV. You know, you have thousands of channels, and everybody keeps everything forever. They're really struggling with what to do with all this digital content, and they don't know. A lot of people are keeping it on hard drives. Hard drives have a five-year life. If you don't spin them up probably several times a year, you will not be able to recover anything. What kind of price points are you looking at? For so its, uh... the first drive is targeted, the list price is $18,000. Oh, so you're really going for the high end. We uh... are going for the high end, and the media is $180. So this is not a consumer format unless, yeah, right. you know, I'm sure there are consumers out there that would be willing to buy it, and we'd more than happy to sell it to them. So we're really targeted yeah. at the people that make the movies and the people that shoot all the news as opposed to the people that watch it. Well, that would that would recoup some of your 
R&D costs yes. initially. Yeah, yeah. But but do you, is it is it uh, a feasible technology to eventually get into the consumer yeah, world? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. To really reduce costs, the components need to get smaller. It needs to be simplified. But this well, is the first time that this technology. Yeah, has I'm ever surprised come to it's not just in the uh, military world. Uh, well, there is interest there as well. <laughs> I imagine. I imagine so. And Liz, what's your role in all this? Um, I'm the vice president of marketing at Infase. Ah, okay. So. Now, is there a whole team of people developing yeah. this technology? We have uh, over 100 people in the company, and yeah. I'd say about 95 of them are scientists and engineers. Yeah, and many of them so, working on this project? Yeah, uh, all cool. of them working on this project. <laughs> yes, there's no slackers. For, so, for yes. years now? Is that yeah, so? we've been in... Because um, we've heard about holographic storage first in the... I was yes. first at InfoWorld in the early 80s. You know, oh, that was, well, uh, yeah, okay, that was before my time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite, but... Um, yeah. So the, the team at Bell Labs actually started working on it in 93, like in the early 90s. 93. Okay. And then the company was formed in 2000. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we have been seriously, you know, we had to like finish the media formulation and then really get going in terms of the drive development. And so we actually have uh, a pure research team and what they really do is push the envelope in terms of transfer rates and capacities that will get kind of uh, integrated into future products. And then we have an engineering team that's really, that's working on the drive that we have that, that we're bringing to market. Market. And then we also have a, um, a media development team that is actually doing research in the material science area. And then we also have a consumer team huh? that's kind of looking out even further. Yeah, yeah, that's what yes. I was saying. That's where yes. it's naturally going to go. Yeah. That's where the volume yeah. is. Yeah. And, you know, everything becomes a consumer product eventually. Right, exactly. So, whether you ever intended it or not. So imagine if you could have an HD, you know, movie, really good quality on a handheld device. You know, we could do that. Yeah. Yeah, or, or play or back on a exactly. handheld yes. projector. Yes, and, uh, yes, yes. Turn. So the company was formed uh, as a spin-off of Bell Laboratories. Bell Labs. Bell Labs, started this started, originally. Yeah, they started this in the early 90s. And the challenge with holographic had always been there was no suitable recordable material. They were using, there was a kind of a cube or a crystal that was based on lithium niobate, and it was expensive, not a good commercial quality pad. And the only people that were doing this were like universities and hardcore research institutions, such as Bell Labs. So what they decided to do is start from where they wanted to end. So they looked at all the attributes that they needed to have to make a successful commercial product and worked backwards. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, as opposed to taking this is what I've got, how am I going to make it work going forward? And so they went, it took them in a completely different direction than anything had been done before, and they wound up working with photopolymers. So our material is, in essence, a light-sensitive plastic. When we started, there were very few research companies doing anything in the area of holographic storage yeah. and now there are about 22 different companies that are doing research and many of them are buying our material. I mean there are other companies that are working on material development but I think we have a very unique position in that we have a lot of expertise in both the material science as well as all the recording technologies for how to really get very very high density data. The other thing that's nice about this as well is it's file based so you could have you know, it looks like a, a drive letter from a systems perspective, and so what we've really tried to do is make it very easy to integrate within a kind of a computer infrastructure. So it shows up on your desktop as another hard drive, yeah. Yeah. basically, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. you have very, very high density data storage, you can put a lot of data in a very small package. So if you, you could make it credit card size, you can, and the other thing is you can make it any format that you want. We're choosing round because it's a very, uh, kind of leveraging existing infrastructure. You could make it a card with um, kind of like a scanner that moves across it. You can make it the size of a postage stamp. Now, you're not going to get 300 gigabytes, but you may get 10. And it may be more than you need or just write what you need in terms of consumer application. Yeah. It takes real culture vultures to appreciate what's here on the walk. People walk by completely oblivious. I yeah. Know. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, it truly is.